Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ana Diaz. I'm project officer at Alzheimer Europe. Um, as you might have seen in the program, Helen Roger Brennan was the chair of this session. Unfortunately, Helen was not able to come to Bucharest, so I'm chairing on her behalf. Welcome, everyone, to this session, those here in Bucharest and as well people joining from home online. This is a hybrid session. That means that we have some people joining from home. Please use your, the app of the conference to put your comments and suggestions. We have five speakers today, so we will not have time at the end for questions. It will be after if each speaker, if they use less than their 15 minutes allocated. And the session is on the topic of needs and experiences, so a really important topic. I'd like to introduce Without further ado, our first speaker, who is Rhoda McRae. <clears throat> She's a reader at the Alzheimer's Scotland Centre for Policy and Practice. Rhoda is going to present preliminary findings from the first phase of a study exploring dementia in prisons. Rhoda, the floor is yours. Hi, good afternoon everybody. Thank you very much for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about this preliminary findings of the study. Um, we have been generously uh, funded um, by the Dunhill Medical Trust. My slide seems to be missing, so I'm going to scoot on to, I've got two slides missing actually. Yep, no, it's... Definitely two slides missing. So what I was going to tell you is that I'm going to tell you a little bit about my talk plan. So I'll talk a little bit about the background to the study and then talk you through the aims and the objectives and then some of our preliminary findings of phase one of the study. The study has three phases. So a little bit about the background, first of all. We really don't know an awful lot about the numbers, needs and experiences of people living with a suspected or diagnosed dementia in prison. But what we do know is that the prison population in Scotland is ageing, as it is everywhere, and it's doubled in the last decade. Oh, there it is. So there was a study done in 2020 down in England, and this is probably the most up-to-date study in terms of what we know about dementia in prisons. And the Forsyth team there found out that there was a prevalence of 6.8 in the over 50s, and they also found a prevalence of 1.3 with people who have mild cognitive impairment. Only three of the 70 people that they identified were women. Out of those 59 who had a diagnosis with, or they a screened to suspected diagnosis of dementia, only two of the 59 had that recorded in their healthcare notes. And they, they and other studies have found that other older prisoners have really serious health, social and custodial needs that are often going unidentified and unmet in prison. And this issue is not new but it does represent a major health inequality in an already vulnerable population. These figures also suggest that people are only identified in a prison setting if they have an existing diagnosis or they're of significant concern to prison officers on the wings. So the aim of this 18 month study that is currently ongoing is to develop new ways to improve the health and well-being of the increasing numbers of older people living with dementia in prison. We had five objectives, and I'm going to talk mostly about the objective, the first objective here, which was to describe the current referral, diagnostic and post-diagnostic health care pathways that are currently in place in the four prisons that we looked at. We also want to understand how the staff, and there's a variety of staff that I'll explain a little bit more about, are promoting health and well-being. We're talking to individuals who have a suspected or actual diagnosis. And then the third phase is that we're going to work with all our stakeholders, all the people that we've talked to, 
um, and some strategic leaders to start to identify how we can improve that pathway and inform, do a co-produce a model for promoting well-being and reducing health-related risk. So we, that's what we've been doing. We've been mapping the current referral diagnostic and post-diagnostic health healthcare pathways in the four prisons with the largest number of over 65s. The prisons are really diverse in size and population. We interviewed 20 staff. So the NHS has healthcare centres that are located in each of these establishments. So they have staff working in and on the ground. But they also have in-reach staff who come in and provide some additional support. We talk to social workers, we talk to prison officers and social care staff who are contracted by the Scottish Prison Service to provide care. They're not part of the health care provision. They are contracted, so they are considered external agencies. During this mapping exercise in the four establishments, we identified 13 men with a suspected or diagnosed cognitive impairment. All of these men had multiple comorbidities. So what we found was that the processes for identifying, referring and diagnosing were varied and they were inconsistent within and across the prisons. Our findings really mirrored the recent Mental Welfare Commission report into Scotland's prisons in that there was no correlation between the skill mix of staff and the size needs of the population. And there was no lead for older people or people with dementia. And getting access to specialist healthcare staff, or indeed other staff that were not located in the prison was not necessarily straightforward. What we found was that the system was really relying on committed staff really relying on those who had a special interest and a special compassion for individuals affected by cognitive impairment. We also found that all the men had care plans in place, but there wasn't a joined up approach to meet their health and social care needs. So as I mentioned previously, the staff that are providing the social care on the wings or the halls, depending what they're called, are external agencies. So there was a communication issue going on between communicating with these external agencies, these social care providers, and the NHS staff who work in healthcare suites in the prisons. So I'll move on now to talk about educational needs. All of the staff that we talked to, all 20 of them, identified that they needed dementia education. Some of them wanted a basic awareness so that they could support identification and understand a bit more. Those were the prison officers largely, but other staff wanted much more education so that they could feel much more equipped with the knowledge and skills to work with the increasing numbers with complex and enduring conditions such as dementia. They felt that Although we found 13 that there was underdiagnosis going on, These, there was more in the system, but they weren't being identified. And they felt that to, in order to identify people and support them to, with the care and support that these people needed, they wanted education. I think it's also worth saying that all the men had really multiple health and social care needs. They, although we identified 13, we could only approach eight because um, others were, did not meet the criteria. They were too ill or too impaired to speak to. One died during our data collection and also during our data collection, at least three had acute hospital admissions. So next steps, we're going to complete the case studies. We've already spoken to five men and we'll also speak to some of their significant others. And then we're going to hold workshops and invite all our stakeholders 
to hear the evidence that we found, to hear the mapping and the case studies, and we'll work with them to use that to create evidence-informed referral diagnostic and post-diagnostic care, care pathways. The other thing that's going to be happening in 2023 is that I've got a small new project to assess the feasibility of cognitive screening in prisons, because currently it doesn't happen. And those are some references. Thank you. Thank you, Rhoda. Thank you so much. As you haven't used your 15 minutes, I have a question from you from the app. Sure. Um, do you feel prison accelerates dementia symptoms with less opportunity for social stimulation and more so soli solitary time? It could well do. I can't say definitively that it does, but what we do know is that most of the men that we encountered were, as I say, had multiple complex health and social care needs. They couldn't participate in programmes. They were often too frail to do so. They had limited mobility, so they spent large amounts of time on their own in their cells with limited opportunities for socialisation and limited opportunities for participation. Thank you. We have still time for another question in, in, the, in the room. Hi, uh, um, I'm Gordon Dawes from the Scottish Government. Uh, it's very, very good to see your presentation today and uh, it's, oh, you'll be aware that we're developing the next uh, national dementia strategy in Scotland. And this is a particular area uh, that myself, I'm quite interested in this. I've already had internal discussions with policy colleagues in justice. Uh, I think uh, it's something we need to take uh, forward in Scotland. So I'd be very keen to hear more after today and please get in contact with the Scottish Government Dementia Policy Team because we'd like to know more about this issue. Thank you, Gordon. I've already been in touch with some of your colleagues and some of them sit in our research advisory group, but I will get in touch with you individually and definitely get well, you involved. Well, that's great. Thank you very much. Any, we still have time if there's one more question. No? So, Rhoda, thank you so much because it's a really interesting topic and I think overlooked very often. And I'm really glad that you brought this topic to the conference and we can reflect on this specific environment where research is so much needed. So thanks a lot. I'd like to introduce now our second presenter. Our second presenter is Anna Jack Walk. She is from the University of West Scotland from the United Kingdom. Anna, your, the floor is yours. to be able to talk about um, PPI in education. So we've had lots of discussion uh, in the conference about public involvement in research, but today I'll be telling the story about public involvement in education and education development. The Dementia Champions Programme has been running in Scotland for 11 years, and there's a virtual presentation later on today if you want to look at the detail of the programme. However, the intention of the programme is to develop change agents and the recruits are from all health and social care professional groups, but particularly from acute hospital care and surrounding environs. We've evaluated this programme for the last 11 years and additionally there has been a doctorate study into how the programme is experienced by dementia champions. Excuse me. <clears throat> and the six categories there are what the dementia champions have told us is effective for their education. I'm okay, thank you. And how that these categories support them to have immediate and sustained change in terms of their perception of themselves and perception of people with dementia, in addition to both the knowledge and the value change that we see as part of the programme. So we were asked by the Scottish Government and NHS Education Scotland to take what was a five-day face-to-face delivery 
across all areas of Scotland into the digital sphere. And this was part of the Scottish Government's COVID-19 recovery plan. <clears throat> now, in order to do this, we retained the same values and underpinning approaches, but also we added trauma-informed approaches, state-of-the-art COVID research, and we delivered from August 21 to March 2022. And this pivot online needed a substantial amount of support and investment. And these are all the people that invested and supported that pivot. Because we'd seen that the voices of people with dementia were central to the changes the dementia champions had reported, it was important to us that within the digital sphere, the voices of people with dementia remain central to the programme. So 10 films were produced with people with dementia by an expert facilitator and an expert filmmaker. In addition, we had the support and encouragement and participation of members of the Scottish Dementia Working Group and NDCAN, support for NHS Education for Scotland and the Scottish Government as well. So what we're going to see now is the expert facilitator, Barbara Sharp, and a colleague, Alison McKean, talk about what they learned was essential to developing these films with people with dementia and their families. It's a good question, Alison, and it's something that took quite a lot of thought. Uh, I think with regard to making the film resources, that the, the relationships were absolutely key. And, you know, I had a great advantage in terms of having been a, a member of staff before. It meant I had existing uh, relationships with the, the, the key networks involved here. So with the, the teaching team itself at the university, but also with the campaigning groups um, of the Scottish Dementia Working Group and the National Dementia Carers Action Group, who were all participants in, in making these film resources. And I think the other key people that were involved here were the staff facilitators who supported those groups. Um, they were extremely useful in terms of beginning to help me prepare people properly for taking part in the films and also making the practical arrangements. So long before the films themselves actually got made, what we did was have lots of informal conversations, and that was partly with the teaching team to find out in detail what content was required, and with the potential participants, so people with dementia, families and carers and some other professionals. And it meant that we could talk through the nature of the programme what was actually required in terms of content, talk to them about the kind of stories that they wanted to tell, because that's the key part of it. It wasn't just what, you know, the, the education side required. It was very much an opportunity for people to tell the stories that they wanted to tell. And so we would have informal conversations, first of all, and that allowed us to to see what people were interested in taking part in making the resources. And another great advantage for us in doing that is that the, the National Carers Group and the uh, people with dementia and the working group all have as part of their own priorities a commitment to assisting with education. So they were already, if you like, very, very prepared to help in any way that they could. But Obviously, we were discussing at times quite difficult situations. So the preparation was important, I think, to be clear about how people want, wanted to talk about things, what the limits were. And I would prepare in advance, once these informal conversations had taken place, a kind of storyboard, if you like, based on a combination of that conversation that I'd had with them and what the teaching team were looking for. And that storyboard, I think, was extremely useful in that it, it helped with timing, it helped keep people on track, but it also meant that people could 
reflect on it before we actually did any recording and they had the opportunity to maybe make amendments or suggestions and they would come into the recording having had time to think this through and so they, they knew roughly what we were going to cover and that there wouldn't be any surprises, you know, that were, were going to make them feel awkward. And we had all kind of agreed what the kind of ground rules were in advance. And I would see that early preparation really is the start of gaining consent, which was an ongoing process, really, you know, at every contact, we're just checking that people are, are happy to do this. We, we could certainly see in the films um, how, how comfortable people seemed and, and how natural the conversations were, which I think is a, a really good reflection on all the preparation that was put in. Not a good editor, so excuse for that f final cut-off. So imagine we've taken a five-day face-to-face programme and put it online. We know what the face-to-face -face programme does, we know how it's enjoyed, we know about the long-term impact on participants. So it was a risk for all of us to do this, in including the people who commissioned the education. And we're very relieved to say that the findings of our evaluation say that the online delivery matches there's a slight decrease in overall enjoyment but in terms of the findings and the uh, changes in attitudes values and perceptions and the wish to work in partnership with people with dementia with the findings are very very similar with the online program and the digital program and as we hoped and as you can see that the bespoke films by and with people with dementia were still valued and seen as the most effective in short, time, short term and sustained change, positive change for the participants. My green button's not working. Oh, there we go. So thank you very much for your time. And um, as I say, there's an, a virtual presentation that looks at more detail of the programme itself. But I was very pleased to represent the hard work of the Scottish Dem Dementia Working Group, the National Dementia Carers Action Network, and everyone who supports the Dementia Champions programme. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. Anna. Excellent presentation. Uh, is there any question? I don't have any in the app, but is there any comment or question from the people attending in Buka in, in person? No? I just wanted to ask, is, are the materials available from people who are not in Scotland or is something, or, or are these materials only for people? The materials mm. are for only for people who participate on the program. In the program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we are looking and, th and thinking about and considering making the program more widely available in the different formats now that we've had proof of concept of the digital delivery. So it sounds like a really excellent program. Thank and you. I was very happy as well to be many of the faces from the Scotland, uh, Scottish Working Group on the screen. Yes. So very good. Exactly. Thank, Thank you, you Anna. Thank And I'm very pleased to introduce the next speakers, uh, Laura O'Filvin and Kevin uh, Quaid. Laura is the research and policy manager at the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland. She holds a PhD from the Dementia Service Development Centre at Bangor University in Wales and has a, a background on academic research. And Kevin is from Limerick and was diagnosed with Lewy body dementia in 20. Uh, 17 at the age of 53. He's a member of the Dementia Research Advisory Team, the Irish Dementia Working Group, as well as the Vice Chair of the European Working Group of People with Dementia and a co-founder of the Lewy Body Island. You do make me sound good, Anna, thanks. <laughs> um, I want to begin by acknowledging something very important. I was at this conference in The Hague three years ago talking about PPI and the Dementia Research Advisory Team. I've spoken about it publicly many times since. 
While I am the person standing here in Bucharest giving this presentation, there are so many other members of the Dementia Research Advisory Team who are not in a position to travel, but are equally involved and important. And if you look at the screen, these are the faces of the Dementia Research Advisory Team. Laura and I are honoured to be here representing them. The Dementia Research Advisory Team is a group of people with dementia and family carers and supporters who get involved in research as co-researchers. We work in partnership with researchers across Ireland to create, design, deliver and disseminate result research. We have done a huge variety of work since starting in 2019 and grown in numbers. So we now have 22 members. Laura and I could not be here talking about PPI without acknowledging the fantastic Kira O'Reilly, who's over here at the end, and she'd kill me after. <laughs> Thank you, Kira. Kira is the coordinator of our group and ensure we feel empowered to be PPI contributors. Having been involved in so much research over the past number of years, the members of the Dementia Research Advisory Team have highlighted the following items as important for designing projects that reflect the needs of people living with dementia. If you want to design a research study that reflects the needs of people with dementia, ask them. The number one thing is to include people from the very beginning. And by this I mean when you're thinking about the idea, not after the funding application has been written. To so say, why? We have new perspectives and research ideas that might not be written or talked about. We live this every day. So we see and experience things that researchers and academics don't see or might not know about. I know what it's like to have and live with Louis biodementia. My colleagues know what it's like to live with other types of dementia or to care for a person with dementia. We can bring these insights to the table and help researchers to do new and exciting work. We can help set, re set research priorities and put research questions into context. Research funders want to know how research will translate to real life. Who can provide this information better than us? We are real life. Look at me. I can speak. <laughs> Designing and planning research studies. We can provide insights and advice that will make the experience of taking part better for participants, which will help keep participants in the studies. These could be anything from the length of questionnaires, venues, or managing upsetting topics. <laughs> so how do you actually include people with dementia in this pre-research stage? Because it's really tricky, the project doesn't exist, the funding doesn't exist, so how are you actually supposed to go ahead and do it? Well, this paper, Minding the Gap, was led by Dr. A.D. Nihay in University College Dublin with input from various organisations that have PPI programmes in Ireland, including ourselves, the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland. And it's led to the development of four key values, which is respect, openness, flexibility, and reciprocity. And these are really important at this kind of idea development stage. So you don't actually have a project yet. You're just thinking about your project. And what you'll notice now that much of what we say, myself and Kevin, is actually, it obviously applies to people but it also applies to, to anyone. Um, so it, it's the best way to be kind of accessible and inclusive if, if you can. So the first value is respect. And it is really important to value those diverse perspectives and knowledge and contribution of each individual with an openness to learn. So if you have a project idea and you're really attached to it, it becomes really tricky then to, to take on new ideas and to change it. So if you try and work with your PPI contributors before you get too attached to your project, that's really important. And I think it means bringing in PPI contributors because you genuinely want to hear from them. You genuinely want to know what they have to say, not because it's a requirement in the funding application or not because it looks more favorable. And it's also about ensuring that your PPI contributors are equipped and empowered with enough knowledge that they feel like they can bring something 
bring to the table. They need to understand what's happening in your project. And sometimes this can, can take a while because you might need to meet with them several times beforehand to explain it. You might need to provide really strong and good quality plain language information to make sure that that relationship exists and they feel empowered. The second value then is openness. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that not all ideas can work. So, you know, that's okay, and we can't pretend that they all will work. I've been in so many meetings where a, a PPI contributor will bring forward several brilliant ideas, but some of them just aren't possible. But what we don't want is for ourselves or for researchers to nod and say, that's a great idea, yet yeah, we'll do that, but actually not be able to do it, is much more respectful and clear to be open and transparent about what is possible and what is not possible. Similarly, unfortunately, we all know that the majority of funding applications are, are not actually funded, but PPI contributors won't necessarily know that as well, so it's really important that we're open about that, that the, the work might not lead to a funded project. I think another really important feature of, of openness is those kind of spaces and places where meetings take place. So for a person living with dementia, a university is not the best place for a meeting. They're big and stressful and there's no parking and coffee is expensive. So find a safe and neutral space that has, um, that enables, I suppose, open dialogue. So this could be a cafe. Kevin and I prepared this presentation in, in a lobby of a hotel. Uh, it could be a room in a local library. They don't necessarily have to cost money. You don't necessarily have to put on a big catering spread. It's just about meeting kind of a, a, as two human beings on, this, on the same playing field. Um, furthermore, safe spaces are those where people feel equal. So consider who is in the room. One PPI contributor and five research scientists isn't ideal for the PPI contributor to, to feel like they are empowered. Um, flexibility. So it's really important that you consider you might need to work in new and different ways when you're working with PPI contributors with dementia. So some meetings might need to take place outside of the usual working hours or in different spaces, as I mentioned. And we need to be imaginative about how we include people. But what I've learned, I suppose, over the last couple of years is if you just ask people, have that really open and honest conversation at the beginning of what works best for you, what works best for me, and let's meet in the middle and figure it out. We don't need to go and, I suppose, try and preempt or to predict what the person might want. That, that They'll be more than willing to tell you if you give them the space. And finally, reciprocity is so important. We need to ensure that meetings and conversations are accessible and that we can be open about you know, why are we doing this? What are the gains for you? What are the gains for me? And I think it's really important that PPI isn't considered an altruistic exercise. We're not doing it because we're great people. We don't want Kevin doing it because he's a great person. He is a great person, but we don't want him doing it for that reason. It, there needs to be acknowledgement on both sides that it makes research better. So it's a need to have. It's not a nice thing to do or a nice thing to have. My colleagues and I participate in the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland Research Review Committee. I have also been a research review panel member for the Health Research Board. So what do public reviewers look for when score funding applications? The first thing we do is read the plain language summary or abstract. If you can't understand it, then it's not a plain language abstract. How can I score something properly if I can't understand it, like, honestly. It gets the whole review off to a bad start, so it's important to spend time on it and get it right. I recommend using headings and bullet points, break it down into these headings, so each part is clear and accessible. Ask a family member or a friend who knows nothing about your area to read it, not a colleague. If you have to use a complicated phrase, then make sure you include one line to describe what it means. The Dementia Engagement and Empowerment Project has an excellent guide for writing for people with dementia. The whole application should be accessible in language and tone. Many public reviewers will read most of the application, so remember to describe complex jargon and concepts. I won't necessarily be reading the, st the statistics section, sorry, but I will be reading the background, the impact, how you are recruiting people, and many others. And finally, acronyms. 
acronyms. If it's a short piece of writing, it's usually okay to write an acronym once. But if it's a longer piece, you should use a full phrase every time, as we might not remember what the acronym name means. These are small adjustments that you can make, but they will make a very big difference. So I think we're aware now that like, PPI is best practice and more and more research funders are requiring and scoring PPI. So the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland is a small research funder, but we are a research funder nonetheless, and this is, this is our advice to you. So PPI sections are not only reviewed by the public reviewers, they're also reviewed by our scientific committee as well. And what they really see is they see PPIs as a mark of due consideration and as a mark of quality. So it's really important that you have it throughout the application because we need to ensure that whatever is being developed or evaluated will actually work and will be of benefit. So many fun funding applications have a PPI section and the scoring for PPI might look low in comparison to you know, the, the innovation part or the, the impact part, but don't underestimate the impact of it, even if it's only 10%. It's a mistake to see it as just one small section in, in a big application. It should really permeate through your whole application. The word PPI should be there several times and on most pages, not just in that one small section. So here you'll see this is an example of scoring criteria from 2021 from the Health Research Board, and they're one of Ireland's largest research funders. So PPI, as you can see, doesn't have a value attached. It's, it's not mentioned there, so why, why would PPI matter? But Kevin has just spoken about how PPI contributors can influence the research question, how they can bring about innovation, how they can bring about new and exciting things. He has also spoken about how you can give advice on the design and methodology of the project. Is it appropriate? Is it statistically appropriate? Probably. But is it appropriate for your population of choice? We, we, we don't know unless we speak to PPI contributors. Similarly, your applicant team experience and experience relevant for the project. Obviously, you need your clinicians and your statisticians and your research staff, but you would be remiss not to include the, the population of choice in, in your application. So here is an example as well. So you can see here, an assessment of your PPI approach may influence the assessment of any or all of the criteria depending on the nature of the proposed research. That is the Health Research Board saying they need to see PPI throughout the whole application. And unfortunately, People t tend not to see that because they don't see the 10% or the 20% or the 50%, but it is there. They're, they're telling us loud and clear it needs to be part of it. And that is the, the approach now of most funders in Ireland. So here's an example of the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland. So we have several scoring criteria and PPI. As you can see, it's again, it, it's just 10%. But actually, we're putting it up to researchers to see how they understand and how they value PPI. There are so many free resources now on PPI. There's books, videos, academic articles, podcasts, films. So even if you have no formal access to, to PPI training, and, and you might well not, it's not as popular in most countries, um, but you can go and you can educate yourself. And actually, members of the Dementia Research Advisory Team have created a document on how you do PPI with people who are living with dementia. So here we can see PPI should be adequately factored into the project, and the key word is adequate. So what does that look like? So you need to consider if PPI has been included in every work package of the project, if appropriate, uh, your budget, remuneration, tea, coffee, lunch, travel, meeting spaces, again, that are safe and accessible. In large applications, including PPI as a work package on its own can be really impressive. And similarly, um, having a point of contact, who is going to be the person that works with the PPI contributors? Who is their point of contact? And I will always look at the point of contact and see what their other roles and responsibilities are because I need to make sure that they have enough time to actually work with their PPI contributors in a respectful way. So to sum up, PPI is definitely more challenging in this pre-application stage because as I said, we don't have the funding and we don't have the project just yet. But it can be done, and it can be done really well. Nothing is more motivating than coming away from chatting with your PPI contributors who are just as excited about the project as you are. Research is really challenging. Um, we're, we're always, I suppose, critiqued and given feedback that we might not necessarily want. But having PPI contributors in my corner has made the hard days in research so much easier. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura and Kevin. There's time for a quick question. Is any 
one quick one question from the public. From yes, well, can you wait for the mic? If not, they don't hear from you at home. Uh, yeah, it's just to. Um, I wonder what your thoughts were on uh, on people with dementia and family carers being paid to take part in research. Do you mean as a research participant or as a PPI contributor? Uh, both. <laughs> both. Um, so for research participant, I do think it's really important to remunerate people for their time, but I think we also need to be aware of like the ethical considerations of that. Um, you know, if someone has a, a much lower income, um, we don't want to make people offers that they can't refuse. We want them to be taking part in research because it's what they want to do, not because they, they urgently need um, some payment or some money. So a nice way to do this can be smaller tokens like vouchers. And then in relation to PPI contributors, they should not be the only unpaid person in the room. They're there in their capacity as an expert, the same way that your clinician and your statistician and your research officer is. So um, it would be very pro um, yeah, remuneration and appropriate payment of PPI contributors. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our next speaker is Andy Northcott. And Andy is a senior lecturer in sociology of medicine at the Geller Institute of Aging and Memory at the University of West London in the UK. Andy. That one. Hi, so yeah, hi, I'm Andy Northcott. Um, I'll get the boring bit out of the way first. So the research I'm gonna talk about today was funded by the UK. Um, Department of Health and Social Care, and it in no way reflects their views. Um, I do hospital research. Since about 2015, I've been doing qualitative research looking at the experiences of people living with dementia when admitted to an acute hospital setting. Um, I'm going to sort of skip through these first few slides because they're the boring bits we've probably all heard before. But basically, there's a lot of people living with dementia going into hospital. Official estimates for the UK put it at one in five beds at any one time. When you're on wards, it's easy to see it as one in three beds, one in two beds. And that ignores that many people with dementia don't know they have dementia until the incident that leads them going into hospital. Things like falls, UTIs, pneumonia. Um, and the there are much higher risk of poor outcomes, including mortality, than patients admitted to hospital with the same condition but without the dementia diagnosis. Um, and so myself and my colleague, Professor Katie Featherstone, have been trying to find out why. And it's not as if the NHS doesn't know about this and isn't trying to do things about it. So there's been a response. This picture is a typical dementia-friendly board. I can't remember where I took this photo, but almost every acute ward has one saying what that ward does to be dementia friendly and who the dementia champion is and lots of nice pictures of forget-me-nots and blue flowers. And there's all kinds of schemes and the this is me forms that they put at the bottom of the bed. But we found when we went and spoke to people living with dementia, they were still terrified of going into hospital and the same with care partners. So despite all of these things and all of these years, hospitals still weren't working and the outcomes were still just as bad. So we wanted to know why, and I get to sort of follow on nicely from your presentation now, we went and spoke to people. And one of the things people kept telling us was there was lots of things about dignity and we're sort of pushing on that and it's things that people don't like talking about. But one of the things was not being able to go to the toilet and being stuck in bed or being stuck in a chair all day. Um, and so from that, I ended up spending three years of my life dedicated to watching people go to or not go to the toilet in hospital. Um, but it sort of fits in with the needs. It's the most basic human need in a way. Um, and so we, we managed to, Katie worked her magic and we got some money from the UK government and off we went to do an ethnography, which is basically research as observation. We stood taking field notes in six wards in three hospitals across England and Wales. Um, we covered 180 shifts. We didn't cover whole nursing shifts because they're 12 hours long and you can only write for so long. Um, but a typical period of observation was anything from three hours to six hours, depending what was happening on the ward on a given day. Um, we recruited 108 participants. We conducted over 500 short ethnographic interviews. So that's just speaking to people as care is delivered and as people go about doing their everyday things on the ward. Um, and we collected over half a million words of field notes, which doesn't really work for a 12-minute presentation with slides. 
So I'll give an example, don't worry, I'm not expecting everyone to read this, I have highlighted the important bits. But this is just a very typical bit of data of a very typical patient who is um, in a hospital bed on a given day. Um, and the key bit to note is that this patient um, has dementia, but she's able to get out of bed, she tidies up, she goes to the bathroom, she locks the door, um, the nurse talks about her independence. So why is she wearing a large wraparound continence pad that's visible to the whole ward? And not, not like a small, not the ones you see advertised on TV and like going off roller skating like a huge adult nappy. Um, and what we've identified is this thing that we're referring to as pad cultures. And that is a sort of embedded practice where all people living with dementia, when admitted to a hospital ward, are put into continence pads. Um, regardless of their pre-existing continence, independence, mobility. Um, and the rationales for this are kind of those common sense ones where when you're talking to nurses, yes, it makes sense as long as you're not thinking about the people it involves. So it's a precautionary strategy. It's just in case. We know they can get to the toilet, but if they can't make it there or if we're not here, it's something to... Um, but what we actually found was it wasn't just in case for the patients. It was just in case for the wards. It was a way of making sure that all the tasks could be done because, yes, I mean, nurses are usually good people. They, Jesus, they don't go into the career for the money. So they want to be able to help people. They want to be able to get up and walk people to the toilet. But um, on a typical NHS ward, for those from outside the UK, you'll have six to eight beds in a bay with one nurse and one healthcare assistant responsible for all of the everyday care for those eight patients. And possibly in a couple of side rooms because someone's called in sick or they couldn't get agency workers and understaffing, but that's a tangent I don't have time for. Um, so ward staff talk about this burden that, yes, they know what good continence care is, but they're unable to deliver it. Now, this has huge impacts um, because these things sort of seep and move on. So putting someone in a pad is fine, if they can still get up to the toilet and take it off. But then it becomes the expectation that if someone's in the pad, well, they can use it, and that becomes they should use it. So what you see on wards is a nurse comes onto a bay, um, the person in bed one says, I need to go to the toilet. The nurse has only come onto the bay because she's busy. That's when they come onto the bay. So she says, don't worry, I'm with this person, but you've got a pad on, it's fine. And there's then the expectation that somebody will wet or soil themselves. Something which for a continent person is something they probably haven't done outside of childhood or an unfortunate incident on a stag do they don't want to talk about. So this, this quickly becomes people start getting distressed and there's a dignity level to this. So if you do then have to use the pad, these bays aren't private places. You have gone into a hospital, a continent independent person, and you are now sat wearing for all intents and purposes a nappy that you haven't worn since you were one and you've had to wet or soil yourself, and that produces smells, and it produces discomfort, and it needs to get cleaned up, which means someone coming and pulling a little flimsy curtain around and talking loudly to the care assistant while they do it, while everybody else on the bay hears. And yes, incontinence shouldn't be stigmatised, but unfortunately it is, and now this person's dignity has been greatly impacted upon. And it also creates dependence. Instead of having what we're meant to do, and when the physio team comes in, what everyone's told to do, which is encouraging mobility, encouraging independence, encouraging moving around, we end up with people having to stay in bed and be cared for. So instead of going to the toilet being a proactive sign of independence and understanding and capacity, it becomes something retrospective. It's a mess to be cleaned up. It's one more thing to do on a list of jobs for that day. Um, and this is carried out without the patient's consent. They tend to come in, the pads are put on them. So not only have they not consented to wearing the pad, but the act of taking a pad off, changing a pad and cleaning up a pad is a hugely invasive process which never gets mentioned. And I don't know what this is like in the rest of the world, but in the UK, over all my studies, I've done 360 days of observations on hospital wards, and I've only heard genitalia referred to by its actual name once. Like, people do not say penis or vagina in the NHS, it's verboten. So instead they talk around it and they use these weird euphemisms which make sense to nurses because they're changing pads every day. But if one, you've got dementia, two, you're wearing a pad and you've never worn one before, and three, you've just woke up on a hospital ward with no idea where you are, and someone says, I've come to check your pad, or I've come to clean downstairs, you're not expecting them to immediately thrust their hand down your pants. Yet that is what happens. And so this obviously causes distress. 
But people with dementia aren't allowed to get distressed, especially not in hospital, because that is agitation. This person is now resisting care. This is aggression. This is challenging behavior. We need to manage this. It might be an excuse to get a one-to-one -one care on the ward, which makes the day's work so much easier. Okay, so this has a huge impact on personhood. So placing the person into the pad, there's the institutional gowns, but also once you get to this point of agitation, of distress, everything gets reclassified. So now the person isn't trying to go to the toilet because they can go to the toilet and they want to go to the toilet, they're wandering. And now we've got, it's a fall risk, or they might be absconding. And everything falls into these medicalized things, which mean stay in the bed, which reinforces the need to use the pad that was causing all the problems in the first place. And this is a really vicious cycle of reclassification and risk. And it actually ends up spreading across the bays as you watch, because they don't know who has dementia half the time in acute wards, and then suddenly you have these bays where all the older people are in pads and no one's moving around, and it's a bit grim. So, um, this is kind of a manifestation, though, that we don't talk about continents. Um, Laura was talking about earlier today, and it's weird here, it talked about twice in one conference in one day, because it's something we all do, but we all do in private. And because we don't talk about it, it's not seen as a corp. It absolutely is a core piece of care and nursing and healthcare assistance work. But it's not one that's talked about or measured. Um, things that we quantify, am I doing okay for time? So, so nurses are terrified of falling behind. They have to keep up with the quantified visible tasks that hospital management and senior managers and doctors value. Um, and so going back to the risk thing, falls, very, very bad. We must not have a tick on the fall thing. It doesn't matter how many continence pads we get through on a given day. Um, and so it essentially becomes the continence pad becomes a form of restraint that allows the hospital to do the tasks, well, the nurses to do the tasks that the hospitals value while ignoring those that it doesn't. So there's little recognition that practice, that this practice is important, even though it is. And I've lost my place. Ah, I can see over there now. There's little recognition that any of these implications, these impacts on dignity and it, then these impacts can be really significant. If somebody gets really distressed because somebody repeatedly keeps trying to touch them in private places that they don't understand who the person is, why they're doing it, what's going on, if they keep getting agitated and then security gets called and then this person is now distressed, they might not get to go home. They might have to go to a care home because when they do all the checks and they can't do the occupational health check because the patient's so frustrated. And then even if they do get to go home, are they going to go back to hospital again? Because no, now they're terrified of the hospital because of the bad experiences that go with it. <sighs> so in response, this is where I get to get the building bridges back in. So we're trying to change this. And we're trying to build bridge between policy, practice, and culture. Um, yesterday, people were talking about the Welsh Dementia Friendly Hospital Charter. And we've contributed some of our research to that and um, its work on continence care. Um, we're working quite closely with the Welsh Assembly and with Improvement Cymru. We're doing capacity building by the University of West London. We have a Master's in Dementia Studies. Um, we're building some online training. We're doing a lot of filming with people living with dementia where they talk about their experiences of continence care and then we're presenting that to nurses who tend to be quite shocked because it's not so much as having going, it's because they miss this because they put the person in, they're always doing something. So it's, like, as an ethnographer, you're in a privileged position, in a way, of seeing everything play out over a day that everyone who's actually involved in it completely misses because they're always off doing something else. Um, and we're trying to create sort of cultural shift in nursing. We had a, um, the report that came from this study ended up being a documentary on Radio 4. We got some national media coverage. And from that, we're getting the chance to speak to more and more wards. And we should have a pilot ward starting off in early 2023 where we're going to try and really focus on good continence care and stop this happening. So, yeah, and if you want to know more, we did write a book, it'd be great. It's, it's free on Amazon if anyone wants to read it, have a bit more information on that. But yeah, that's brilliant, thank you. Thank you so much, Andy. Absolutely fantastic presentation. I have a, um, a, a comment for you on the app. It says, Andy, thank you. Not a question, but your research has confirmed my my suspicion on erroneously identifying people with dementia as incontinent in hospital, so pads can be used for convenience. Inability to access the basic human right to go to the toilet and being upset about it is so erroneously identified as a BPSD. Definitely a problem in Irish hospitals as well as apparently. 
Yeah. So I, I don't think we are alone in the UK. I think yeah. it's a more it's one of those who I'm sad to hear. That, <laughs> Is there any comment or question? Yes. Hi, Andy. Um, Hi. Thank you so much for that. That was really insightful. Um, during my research, I found, I'm not too sure if you found this in your own experiences, uh, it was more probably in the private sector yeah. that um, pads, pad, th during the pad culture, uh, they were restricted to three a day as well, I found. Um, and I don't know if that's reflective in the public sector which is just horrifying on so many levels. Um, they don't have that restriction in the hospitals, but I think they do, and it's a di if someone's discharged as then being incontinent, I think mm -hmm. they are prescribed an amount. I don't know what it is, but that's... Uh, um, yeah. Okay, I think there's a second question. Yes. Um, I just wanted to ask you Yeah, just to say thank you for that presentation. I think it's opened everyone's eyes and it's it's such a subject that kind of relates to everything. You're talking about human rights, you're talking about dignity by talking about this one subject. Um, I'm currently working to consult on the next Scottish dementia strategy and I had an engagement event the other day and somebody told a story and said that the person, they went to visit their um, wife who was in a care home and they'd been sat with the pad in for quite a while and they said, is it, you're, you're not going to change the pad or do anything? They said, oh, it can hold that much liquid, like just leave it a little bit longer. And they said, have you, they turned around to the person who was helping and they said, have you ever wore a pad? And they were like, no, I've never wore a pad. And they said, well, I have, because I took one of those pads home and I poured liquid in it and I sat in it for eight hours. I put salty water in it and it, it stung. And they were like, so come back to me when you've done that. And it just shows like how much that matters to people that that, family cared or that husband had went and done that because he knew yeah. how much that meant to the person so it was just to share that story no it's um but, but it's those kind of stories as well and i think feeding on what everybody else said it is that thing of listening to people on these things because when i was doing my phd way too long ago i did not expect to ever be standing in a hospital ward wondering why no one was going to the toilet and ticking off if people were wearing nappies and things and it's yeah like sort of it's, it's, it's missed things, and then when you hear it, it's, it's really key to dealing with it. It's a big comment. Um, I th thank you, Andy, and I think that um, there's other knock-on effects as well around independence. So that's the period of time when the person is in the hospital, yeah. but what happens then when they go home? So, you know, there's been adaptation in their own behaviour, yeah. and then the whole point is that we're trying... You know, everyone's trying to support people to live at home for as long as possible in an independent fashion. So it's counterintuitive that, that this kind of care happens in a hospital setting, but it has a knock-on impact when the person goes home, doesn't have any of that. Uh, you know, they're not in that setting. They're trying to adapt to their old routines. And I also the point around three pads a day, and, you know, the, the, that is a big impact. Yeah. Um, and also, I think there needs to be more done around public health nurses and how they support families to uh, allow people to have dignity at home, access to the conscience care as well that they need um, without feeling that pressure to um, have visual aids and inappropriate things in the home just because of cost measures. So, um, yeah, thanks. I'll stop talking. Yeah, and what you're saying, and it goes beyond that, you're, it's, we, t we talk about the journey home, but what you also see, and one of the more shocking things you pick up in the hospital is, somebody comes incontinent, and then they've been wearing pads, they've been in bed for a week, two weeks, so they have now become incontinent as a result of the admission. But when the doctor, the nurse, calls the family to say, he's ready to come home, but he's incontinent now, so sending pads, they say they can't deal with that, and then it's, it's, it's into a care home, because people don't want to deal with the mess and the pads and the stigma that goes with them, so it can, it can have huge impacts on people. It's, uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Andy. Unfortunately, we have no more time for more questions. It's a fascinating topic. Thank you so much. <laughs> and our next speaker is Chiara O'Reilly, and Chiara is coming from the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland. Chiara, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Balance. I was hoping to keep track of my own time, but I apologize <laughs> if I run on. Um, 
one thing I've learned from this conference in the last few days is that it might be time to start investing in glasses. So I apologize if I squint. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for your time. My name is Kira, and I am the Research Project Officer with the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland. I am going to be discussing today, very briefly, a uh, team up for dementia research, investigating the needs and experiences of people living with dementia who contribute to dementia research. Okay. So in July of 2021, the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland launched its new service, Team Up for Dementia Research. And this service connects people with an experience of dementia with opportunities to engage in ethically approved uh, dementia research in Ireland in a an streamlined and inclusive manner. So it came about because, you know, you'll all be familiar with this, but participant recruitment has long been a challenge in dementia research. And historically, if you wanted to recruit participants, it would have meant contacting local uh, dementia service providers, uh, attending Alzheimer's cafes and social clubs, um, or contacting, you know, members of the public who, or members of the public who live their life in the public eye who have an experience of dementia. Um, very acceptable avenues of recruitment, but I think we can all agree fraught with delays and, you know, naturally that would have an impact on your know, budget considerations and potentially the relevancy of research. And when we look at this from the perspective of people who are affected by dementia, we find that they know that dementia research happens, but they're just not sure how to go about where to get involved. Is that better? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I knew being the shortest member on the panel was going to be a problem. <laughs> um, so Team Up for Dementia Research bridges the gap between people affected by dementia and opportunities to take part in dementia research. The service offers people with an experience of dementia the opportunity to register their interest in taking part in a streamlined and inclusive manner. And I say people with an experience of dementia intentionally. You could be a person living with a diagnosis of dementia, you could be providing informal care to somebody living with the condition, or you could have previously provided care, or indeed the connection could be looser again. You could be a friend or a family member who certainly doesn't identify as a caregiver, but you support the person with the condition by occasionally bringing them to doctor's appointments. So these are all very different experiences of dementia, but all equally relevant to dementia research. And we see that reflected in the opportunities that we offer um, the, the research member or the team of members, um, the projects and inter interventions that come in. So the sign up process is actually a very simple one. It can take five to 10 minutes. People register their interest. Um, they opt in whether to sign up online, um, which is a very brief form, or alternatively, they can speak to a member of the research team. Again, the sign-up process takes five to 10 minutes or you know, 45 minutes if you're in the mood for a chat, totally fine. Um, the opportunity to register to the service, though, in a manner that's accessible to the individual is an important one. We always strive to meet the person where they need. If you feel that you lack the technical know-how or you're you live in a really remote rural location in Ireland and your internet is just not up to scratch. We want to make sure that your voice is still heard in dementia research and that you have the same opportunities as everyone else. So we want to make sure that nobody's excluded. Um, I had a call with a potential new member one day, um, a lovely gentleman who was quite hard of hearing, and he really wanted to take part in dementia research, but he just felt that he couldn't manage on a computer. So he actually signed up via WhatsApp video call. So we will always find a solution. Um, as for the streamlining of the service, when people with an experience of dementia register to the service, one of the most important things we do is take note of their research interest preferences. Uh, there is no point in us offering you an opportunity to um, take part in a clinical trial when really you only have time to fill in an online survey in the evening time, you know, fitting around caring responsibilities or a job. Um, if you're a person living with young onset dementia, for instance, and are passionate about sharing your experiences face to face with a researcher in an interview style situation, that's fantastic. You know, that's what you're most comfortable with. But offering you an opportunity then to take part in an online focus group totally undermines those preferences and it's unnecessary. So this could lead to drop off and you'll become frustrated with the service and then no longer want to take part. So we want to avoid that. So we have some lovely stats here. Um, we find that research is improved, obviously, by having more people involved. And Team Up for Dementia Research has grown significantly in its, since its inception. So boasting numbers in the hundreds now, um, it has a strong geographical reach. The Team Up members represent not just people who live in close proximity to universities and hospitals, but rather those from small towns and rural locations around Ireland. One of our main aims is to ensure that nobody is excluded from dementia research because of their proximity or lack thereof to a research institution. This benefits not just the researcher, but the participants as well. Certainly there are opportunities where members will be required to attend an on-site, um, you know, attend at a hospital for an on-site project, but whether or not that person actually attends is at the discretion of the team up member. 
So the service supports the research community to cast an extremely wide net um, during the recruitment process, increasing their chances of finding participants in a position to attend an on-site project. Uh, members range in age from 23 to 87. It's not super important, but I just think it's a nice stat to share because I think it really highlights the appetite for dementia research. And again, harkens back to representing the entire gamut of experiences of dementia. Um, we recently asked the Team Up for Dementia Research members why they signed up to the service, and this video, which I'm hoping will play, uh, should nicely highlight the range of reasons why people want to take part in dementia research. it was an important part of our journey it was important to Martin um, and you know I remember him saying at one stage when we were considering engaging he had to you know give his blood and his bone marrow and engage in various um, interviews and I remember him at the time saying you know this mightn't do anything for me but it, it, it can help other people. So we decided as a family that we would try and learn as much about dementia and how we can help Mairead and help us. So that's why we decided that we'd go down the road of researching. Um, so I'm not a spring chicken. I'm 78 going on 79. Um, so finding something as interesting as Team Up to do at my age um, was really, really um, something. and. Um, something that I could have been a little bit afraid of at the beginning but um, it's been it's been really good and my family have encouraged it and love to hear all the, the news I have about the various research projects. And I thought what an opportunity to get involved in research and maybe someday that we could do research on Louis Wallis and that's really why I got involved in it but I didn't realise how beneficial it was. all-star cast that you might recognize. <laughs> um, this is kind of just a breakdown of the, the current membership data, within the database. So we're delighted to say that we have 63% um, of the members are current family caregivers or supporters, 24% uh, rep represent former family caregivers and supporters, and 13% of people living with dementia make up the, the final group of uh, members within Team Up. So we're, we're very lucky to really you know, cover all bases. Um, and then on the right hand side, the pie chart um, just breaks down. We don't ask, when a person signs up to the service, we ask them that their experience with the type of dementia or if they have that information. And unfortunately, that's not always the case. There is 5% of people who have you know, diagnosis unknown. Um, and we're hoping to weed that out. We'll see that number come down as the years go on, um, as the service continues to grow. So you'll see vascular dementia, young onset dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, obviously Alzheimer's disease accounts for a large portion. Um, but when a researcher gets in touch with us then and says, you know, I need 30 people who are, have experienced a vascular dementia, do you have anyone like that? We can say yes and we can reach out to those people. So um, in the, since the service is a year old, we decided that it was time to survey the members um, to gauge their experiences of the service to date, um, just to figure out what worked really well and what you know, we could do to improve um, or change the process for them. So I'm sorry to admit that it was really hard to find a negative comment to include. Um, overall, the, you know, the members have had an extraordinarily positive experience and they've really enjoyed taking part in dementia research. A lot of them came to the service with no previous research experience in their background, naturally enough, which was great. Um, and they've just, you know, really found that their input has been relevant to the projects and that their opinions were, excuse me, were welcomed and discussed. So um, it's, been, it's been super. As I mentioned, the majority of the members were new to research, um, but they really enjoy the variety of projects that have been available to them. And then typically when a member gets in, um, express an interest in taking part, when they match with a research opportunity, an email goes out to them to let them know, there's an opportunity available to you, would you like to take part? This is, you know, their interest, their research interest preferences are cross-referenced against the inclusion criteria. So um, what's happened is over the course of the 18 months that the service has been around, you know, people were saying, oh yes, the, the email is very informative, but perhaps there's too much information in one spot, so we have reduced the information, not reduced the information available, but there are links within it that people can click through. 
but also um, it was too much for some people, you know, not everybody's on their phone all the time, not everybody's checking their email religiously. So a lot of the members living with dementia have said that they would prefer a text message as well to let them know that, thank you very much, that um, an opportunity has matched, or that they've matched with an opportunity, um, which has been great because it allows, thank you so much, um, as the person behind the service, I always said that I'm the human behind the service. Um, when I speak to people, I can improve the service as we go because I want to make sure that it will always be personal, that there's something, you know, that we can always facilitate the members to take part. And so if somebody is living with dementia and says to me, I really want to take part, but I can't manage, you know, with the emails that come in constantly, or, you know, I really want to take part, but I'm just not sure that my experience is relevant. You know, we have these conversations on the phone and we can be very reassuring, you know, and put them in touch with the researcher. And it, like I said, it, it's a very personal service and we hope to continue that. So... Thank you very much. When we asked the members as well why they, why they decided it was important for them to take part in dementia research, um, I actually thought the, these comments were lovely. Um, so Catherine is a member and she cares for her mom and she says, I re really just wanted to make a difference. Um, she's very passionate about changing um, dementia and you know, the, the lives of people affected by dementia. Um, Avelyn is in the blue shirt and she said she wanted to contribute in any way that she felt was worth, you know, she feels is a really worthy cause um, and she's able to volunteer her time. Um, Ray and Agnes are other members as well and so really it kind of just shows the broad spectrum of why people sign up to dementia research um, and it, you know it's it's an engaging experience it's very proactive um, it's something that you can really take ownership of so you know we've, we've really enjoyed connecting them with opportunities that suit their interests. Um, finally one of the things that came up in the survey is that people wanted to learn more about dementia research um, they wanted it they wanted digestible chunks of you know research information, scientific information in very palatable, digestible chunks. So we've done that and we've distilled information and we share this with the members by our, with, through our newsletter. Um, we always ask their permission before we send it out. We do say, you know, it goes out five to six times per year. Realistically, it is more like once per quarter. Um, but we do it, we, you know, if there's something new, if there's a wonderful development, we'll share that on the research blog as well. Um, and that, again, that was through the feedback of the members. We wanted to be able to, to meet their needs. Um, interestingly, a lot of the members said, yes, I do want to get the, the newsletter, but I don't want it on email, and they'd rather have something that they can flick through while they're having their coffee. So we send them the newsletter out by post as well. Um, and that's actually the end of my time. So thank you very much for your, your patience and listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chiara, for that presentation. We have time for one question, if any question for Chiara in the audience. If not, I have a question actually for Laura and Kevin that came after your presentation. Uh, and they were asking how my the PPI impact bridged the implementation gap. Is this, is this working? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, so how um, PPI might bridge the implementation gap? Yeah, well, I think um, it can be anywhere from dissemination and when you're planning your impact with PPI contributors, they can tell you how they, they, they need it to impact. And for something we see in the Alzheimer's Society is, you know, we all learn about lots of exciting research that's happening, but it doesn't actually filter down to the people that it impacts. So even an impact that small of people just being able to be aware of what's happening, because that, that brings hope and that's really important. That, that's a small impact in itself, but I think that by just having these open conversations about what's possible and what's not, and PPI makes research better, as you know, I've been, been going on about with Kevin, and that impact can be huge if you can, you know, with the research funders, if they can see your potential for impact, they'll bring it, and the people that can help you make that impact are your PPI contributors in tandem with everyone else who's involved with the research. Um, also, if you involve us, uh, we're very good to get money. Because when they, when they see that we're seriously involved in a research project, they will look at it twice. So, you know, we are handy. Thank you, Kevin and Laura. I just have a comment for you, Kiara, just to say congratulations. It's a wonderful service. So. Thank you very much. Just before we break for the coffee break, just a final reminder. There's the last opportunity to vote for the posters. There's been a lot of work, but many of the people uh, coming to the conference. There is um, a conference here in Bucharest, but also online. And until 4 o'clock today is the last chance to vote for the, your five favorites. 
I am in here in, in, in person, but also in the online. Please make sure you vote with her before four o'clock because a lot of people put a lot of effort in producing the posters and there's a lot of fantastic work out there as well. And with that note, I want just to thank the fantastic panel. I think it's been very engaging, very interesting research, very different domains about experience and needs, all of them very important. So thank you so much for joining us today and as well to the audience here at home. I wish you a final, uh, final plenary session that you enjoy and uh, safe uh, travel back home. Thank you.